evening and welcome to the November 3rd, 2022 Parks and Recreation Commission regular video meeting. I am Jody McCarthy, Parks and Recreation Commission Chair. In accordance with Proclamation 20-28.10 and the Governor's Extended Safe Start Order, tonight's Parks and Recreation Commission meeting is using video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. The Zoom video of this meeting is being recorded and will broadcast live via Zoom and will be uploaded to the City's YouTube channel later this evening. City staff and consultant guests are participating in tonight's meeting remotely. Other audience members are listening to the meeting by telephone or via the internet. Additionally, the City has opened up the Community Centre to provide public space for viewing and participating in the meeting. Welcome to all and thank you for joining us tonight. Commissioners, please turn on your microphones. Will the city staff please call the roll? Thank you, Chair. Chair McCarthy. Present. Vice Chair Strutt. Present. Commissioner Cohen. Here. Commissioner Westberg. Here. Commissioner Markson. Commissioner Burstein. Present. Commissioner Hay. Here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right. Um, as a reminder, Commissioners, uh, prior to speaking tonight, please state your name for those listening in on the meeting. I think we're all very familiar with the whole rules about raising your hand, et cetera. Um, I believe, um, Raven, can you please confirm we have no um, in-person appearances tonight? That is correct, Chair. Okay, so we um, have no public comments tonight. So we are going to go on to uh, the first item on the agenda, uh, which is the department report and update. And we're going to welcome Recreation Manager, Ryan Daly. Good evening, Parks and Recreation Commission. I will share my screen really quickly. Let me know as soon as you see some really nice pumpkins. I see it. Looks All like right. It. I had to put this picture. These pumpkins were done by our city manager uh, for the uh, pumpkin walk this last weekend. So I'll talk about that here a little bit in a second, but wanted to highlight that. And see if these will progress forward. There we go. As a reminder to everyone, uh, city facilities will be closed on Veterans Day. That's Friday, November 11th. Uh, to honor our veterans. And so thank you to all of those who uh, served and, and provided that service to our country. Lincoln Landing has reopened. Uh, some of you may have seen comments uh, regarding that. After five long months of construction and restoration work, uh, it's now again accessible uh, for the public to, to go down and enjoy that waterfront. Uh, the project included reconstructing a creek bed, which was badly eroded, uh, while also building an accessible pedestrian pathway, um, which quite honestly, the primary function is actually for our utility and maintenance vehicles to get down to uh, service the utilities down there at the waterfront. Uh, the stormwater channel restoration provided a better aquatic habitat uh, and protects against erosion, erosion and excess silt that might come down that bed. The crews did design this pathway uh, to be ADA compliant. Uh, that allowing all of our residents access down there, uh, but it also uh, sort of meanders around some of our underground utilities. So there's a number of uh, utilities that are in that area that, it, that this project had to take into consideration. Uh, the pathway will actually hold a 66,000 pound truck, uh, the sewer pump truck, which goes down to the waterfront to access the sewer line down there. Uh, we do have some, some final updates to finish up, and it should be completed uh, in December. So for more information, the link is posted there at the bottom. Uh, we have some community conversation events coming up. Uh, 26 families attended our How to Be an Ally training last week. Uh, the session was hosted confidentially uh, to support that format uh, and provided tools and strategies uh, for people to utilize. The upcoming November 7th session uh, will feature an island resident and parent, uh, Microsoft Chief, Chief Accessibility Officer Jenny Lay Fleury, 
Uh, and the topic will be disability as a strength. So I encourage you to take a look at that Let's Talk page link down below uh, and take part if interested. Oh, the community center fitness room. Uh, we are on a path to getting that back up and running. Uh, as you'll recall, there was an AC unit back when we had those days of, of heat uh, and nice warm weather. That AC was running very frequently and the condensation actually flooded the fitness room floor below. Um, we will be reinstalling or removing and reinstalling a floor uh, November 15th through the 18th. You'll see the dates of October 24th through the 28th crossed out. Uh, that's because we, of course, experienced some issues with the supply chain and being able to uh, install that in a more timely manner. We do have new equipment coming. Uh, so that'll be something for our residents to utilize. And we'll have some opportunities for, for residents specifically who wish to utilize that room uh, to get in there at a reduced rate or even free of charge ahead of the uh, ahead of the end of the year so that they can test out that equipment, uh, become familiar before we start selling passes uh, in 2023. With that, we will be, uh, as soon as that fitness room is updated and ready to go, we will be expanding our community center hours uh, to open at nine o'clock. Currently it's 10 o'clock and the updated hours are listed there as well. I will highlight that uh, Sundays we are still closed. However, we do have a number of rentals that are utilizing the facility right now on um, occasional Sundays, I'll say. So that's always an opportunity uh, for our community if they wish to rent or access the facility, those rental opportunities are available. South Mercer Playfield project, we are getting close. Uh, as a reminder, this is a city school district joint project uh, with the school district being the project manager. Uh, this project kicked off in early July, uh, and we're hoping, and it's looking good right now, about wrapping that up later uh, this month, later in November. Uh, we do anticipate, and we are already receiving calls, uh, we are planning to start accepting facility reservations out there uh, around July. So that will be, we'll be keeping everybody informed of, of when those opportunities come to be. And as a reminder, that's a, a significant uh, installation of synthetic turf, both replacement and new synthetic turf uh, at the South Mercer Playfields. And I'm so, sorry, Brian, can yeah. I just, I, I, you said July is when you're starting um, rentals. I think you mean January. January, January. Yes. Yes, January. Uh, and we're wrapping up the project later this month. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, and more information is located at the school district website below. Bike skills update. Uh, this is sort of a repeat slide because you've all seen this at the last meeting, uh, but I do just want to clarify that there are white dots out on the trees still. Uh, those are to help with the survey and uh, to perform tree inspections. It does not mean that we're removing those trees necessarily. We do have some uh, conversations coming forward, which are community engagement opportunities. Uh, we'll have a survey that was planning on being released today, I'll tell you that that may still happen. Uh, and there's a reason Jason Kittner is not on this meeting because he is uh, finishing up that survey and preparing it so that it can go out. So we anticipate that this evening or tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. We'll be highlighting that around the community so that people can provide their input. Uh, additionally, we'll have an open house on November 17th from 4 to 530 out at Dean's Children's Park to uh, help solicit input toward the 30% uh, design. And I see Commissioner Cohen's hand up. Uh, yes, Don Cohen, thank you. Uh, what, uh, the survey is being distributed by what means? Uh, it's on the Let's Talk site right now. And then we'll be pushing that out through our social media cha channels as well. And, um... Just out of curiosity, you had requested earlier the Parks and Rec Commission to review all sorts of surveys of different sorts, but not this one. Uh, any particular reason? Uh, I would ask Jason Kittner to speak to that. He's not on the meeting, but uh, this is specific to the 30% design that will be coming in front of the Parks Commission on December 1st. 
Go ahead, so I'm happy to follow up with him and have him send an email to the commission. Yeah, because I don't understand what you mean. Are, is this something ask? Well, this it can't be asking people their view on the 30% design because it isn't there yet. <laughs> this is to provide input toward. So we're talking, you're, you're thinking about design and elements that would be included in the in the skills area. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't mind getting a little more information on that, uh, be, at least before the 17th. Yeah, we can. You know, I can have Jason connect with the commissioner, commissioners. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, this will be coming back in front of the Parks Commission uh, that meeting in December, uh, where we'll be talking about a draft thirty percent design for the facility. And then there is the updated Let's Talk page. I'd encourage the Commission to go view that page, uh, have an idea of what's being discussed. That's on the new site. The current site, or I shouldn't say the current site, the site that was closed down at Luther Burb Upper Luther Burbank, we still have that as accessible as well, uh, the Let's Talk page, so that you can go in and take a look at the background and the comments that were submitted uh, through that process also. Arbor Davis Trail Safety Improvements. Uh, you'll recall at the last meeting, uh, right before the meeting, staff received additional questions from WashDOT regarding the roundabout proposal for the trail. Uh, this month, the team, the design team has been meeting with WashDOT to discuss those identified design issues. Uh, KPG and SOMAS are currently drafting those revisions so that WashDOT can review. Well, the plan is to return to the Parks and Rec Commission at that December 1st meeting uh, to revisit that uh, conversation on the 30% design or going towards 60% design. So look for additional information to come out ahead of that meeting as we wrap up those conversations. Oh, trick-or-treating, what a weekend we had this last weekend. Uh, the town center was packed on Friday. And I'll, I'll say one of the amazing things that we have had this year is the weather. It was beautiful out for this event. Uh, tons of kids, tons of parents uh, walking through downtown, trick-or-treating uh, at local businesses. We had a great response from that business community, uh, getting people in, all of, the, all of the kids dressed up as well as business owners. It was really an outstanding event, and we really appreciate our partnership uh, with the Chamber of Commerce to be able to make this happen. Pumpkin walk. Uh, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500 pumpkins uh, at Mercedale Park on Sunday. Uh, staff carved 52 of those. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing that on Friday afternoon. Uh, great staff opportunity. You would be shocked at the, we'll call it skill level or sometimes lack of skill level uh, for carving, but it turned out really great. It was a great staff bonding experience. Um, really one of the first times us as an entire city staff have um, had the opportunity to really get together and do something fun like this. So something that really supported the uh, supported the event and the recreation division really appreciates all of that, all of that support. And just to, to go back to the to the pumpkin walk, it was a great event. Um, I saw a few of you or at least talked to a few of you who were able to attend. Um, we're going to guess somewhere around a thousand people showed up uh, to take part. The weather held off. It was it was an exceptional event. This was our first time that we, uh, as the city, have taken this on, and so it worked really well. We're looking to continue to build partnerships with others to uh, expand in the future. But all in all, it went very well. Huge thank you to our sponsors, John L. Scott, Mercer Island Martial Arts, and Greg Rosenwald Real Estate. It was. Uh, it was a great weekend, great, great set of events. Uh, upcoming restoration events are listed here, uh, as well as additional details on the um, website listed below. So please take a look at that if you have any, any availability to uh, volunteer at those events. And then just a couple of park maintenance updates. As, uh, as you no doubt have seen, there are a lot of leaves out. It's leaf season. Our crews are out trying to keep drains clear, uh, keep the park pathways clear, and um, doing a great job doing so thus far. But it is it can be a losing battle at times, uh, especially when it starts dumping down rain and those leaves get really heavy. We do have some uh, new electric options uh, that are on order that we'll be testing out, and specifically blowers, uh, mini chainsaws, that kind of thing. 
uh, to utilize that electric option as opposed to gas. So more info, we'll report back on that and, and let you know how all of that worked out through this, uh, through this fall and winter. And just a heads up, we do have two vacancies right now within our parks maintenance team. Uh, that team is nine FTEs total, and we currently only have seven staff members. Uh, so that is a challenge when you have the leaves piling up as they do. And so we are looking to get those positions filled later on uh, this month. Uh, I believe the interview process is actually occurring right now. Uh, additional project awareness, uh, Aubrey Davis Park Vegetation Improvement. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter, or Vice Chair Shrek. I, yes, thank you. Uh, Ryan, just on the last slide about, um, you know, the new electric options for blowers and so forth, the thought I just had was, because I know the city and many, many others are, you know, you know, strongly suggesting that uh, residents as much as possible start moving to battery operated things. But as you test equipment out, if you find, you know, this model works so much better than a couple others or whatever, if there's a way to kind of, without kind of recommend, uh, recommending with a capital R, but maybe a soft recommendation saying, hey, you might want to really look at this because we've had good experience. I think that would be valuable to the community. I appreciate that input. I think yeah, I think highlighting the equipment that we use that works well is is appropriate. Uh, Aubrey Davis Park uh, vegetation improvements. Those of you who recall the Aubrey Davis master plan, this was a huge topic of conversation. Uh, currently, our crews are working to uh, improve the forest health there. Uh, we have some trees that are too close together. Uh, which creates some, some challenges for public safety. So we're addressing and selectively thinning and pruning those out, as well as removing the, the English ivy that can be a, a significant challenge for, for some of the areas in, in Aubrey Davis Park. Uh, we do have a contractor uh, planning to complete that work in the, the end of November, early December. Uh, Andrew Prince, uh, who is our uh, trails coordinator in the past. He's our new project manager. He's uh, coordinating this project. So any questions, feel free to reach out to Andrew. Uh, he'd be happy to reply and uh, feel free to CC me as well. So I'm aware of the conversation. And we're getting toward the end of this one. There was a lot going on this month, but we are looking toward Illuminate MI and the lights coming on uh, in town center area. The crews just finished installing. Uh, they took advantage of the great weather we had the last couple of weeks, sped through that installation process, which is outstanding. Uh, so we do expect to have those lights coming on in the next week. We're probably going to hold off on the tree at Mercerdale <clears throat> until the tree lighting uh, that first Friday in December. Uh, but we do expect to have those lights flipped on here in the, uh, the very near future. Uh, which looks great downtown and, and lights things up really well. Uh, with that, I thank you and am happy to take any questions or move right forward. All right, I did not see any cool hands up. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, but before we do, uh, city staff, I just want to acknowledge that Commis Commissioner Markson is now on the Zoom. Um, welcome. Um, okay, so our next item of regular business is to review and consider approving the minutes from the October 6, 2022 meeting. Commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the October 6, 2022 meeting, please? This is uh, Vice Chair Strzok, I so move. Okay, and do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Hey. All right, so there's a, a motion by Vice Chair Strzok and a second by Commissioner Hay. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments before we vote? All right, um, there is none. Commissioners, please turn on your microphones. And will the city staff please conduct a roll call vote? Thank you, Chair. Chair McCarthy? Aye. Vice Chair Strzok? We couldn't hear you, Peter. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Westberg. Aye. Commissioner Markson. Aye. Commissioner Burstein. Aye. Commissioner Hay. Aye. 
All right. And so that has passed. Okay. And we're going to go on to our next thing, which is our third item, and that is the Park Improvement Gift Acceptance and Donor Recognition Policy. And for this item, we re welcome Recreation Coordinator Eleanor Knight. Good evening, everyone. Let me just share my presentation. All right. Uh, thank you again for all of your input last meeting and over email regarding the now named gift acceptance policy. Um, so we're going to briefly go through what happened last meeting and discuss some of the changes to the policy and then um, hopefully move to endorse and begin to discuss procedures tonight. Uh, first, I want to show some examples of gifts. Um, you all asked for this last meeting, so we want to include some pictures of gifts from the past. Here we have a bench donation, including the, uh, the donor recognition object or the plaque that goes on it. Also, this art piece, um, this is called Stan the Dog, and his uh, little donor recognition object here is plaque. And this is the batting cage that was donated as well. And if I could... If I could jump in, this is Ryan, Recreation Manager. Uh, you know, I've had a, a good deal of conversations with different commissioners over the last month uh, on different projects. And so just to kind of go a little bit deeper and just kind of explain what we're thinking. So when you see that bench there on the left, the actual bench is what we would classify the gift as. Uh, in this situation, that, that gift would likely be a part of the um, gift needs inventory. And so that would be an offer, an identified opportunity through that inventory to purchase that that bench essentially, or to donate that bench to the city. The plaque that's highlighted next to it, that's what we consider the the uh, donation donor recognition object, uh, and that's the uh, the object that's usually affixed to the to the bench. Uh, so that's more of those items that fall into that gift inventory area. Stand the dog there in the middle. That's more of an artistic or possibly a memorial type scenario. That's not something that would probably be contained within the gift needs inventory. So that would be something that somebody would more than likely come forward to us and offer to, to gift the city. Uh, so just want to call that out a little bit separately. Then the third items are, so this is an, ex is an example at South Mercer Playfields. Uh, these are the batting cages that are there. I don't believe those were identified in the master plan. However, we did have donors come forward, specifically the Boys and Girls Club, uh, offer funds toward this capital project to place this facility there. Now, it was also a joint project with the school district also, but it kind of highlights how, uh, how a proposal can kind of come forward with some monetary donation, uh, be partially funded maybe, have the city take ownership of that, and then manage it ongoing. So I hope that that kind of helps to uh, share some examples that we're talking about as we go through the product or through the policy uh, to help explain and help create some uh, understanding of what those uh, what those definitions actually mean. So thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, just to breeze through the outcomes from the previous meeting, um, this is all listed in the staff report, but just to go through what was changed uh, in the policy document, um, encouraging public and private gifts, uh, ensuring gifts uh, complement the proposed locations, limiting gifts, donor recognitions, or improvements which detract from character of space or the characteristics of the parks, soliciting community engagement, removing reference to memorial language, um, and removing language of the policy relating to works of art, which will be a separate policy document. And I'll just chime in again, sorry, Ryan, recreation manager, that highlighted item at the bottom is something that we actually wanna change a recommendation on. And we'll talk about that a little bit through the matrix conversation, uh, why staff feels that, that art may, may need to be or would be beneficial to include uh, under the definition of gifts. And with that, we will move to the matrix. Give me one second.
So before Eleanor pulls that up, I, I want to give uh, everybody a shout out and a thank you for her for submitting questions in a in a manner that we were able to kind of put into this matrix uh, and be able to, to think about and provide a staff response. It actually it was interesting to see some consistency uh, in some of the conversations. And so that was really helpful. And, and hopefully that will um, help us move forward in, in establishing this policy. So Eleanor, I'll, I'll pass it back to you or, or to Chair McCarthy to uh, take us through this and find consensus. Right, I was gonna pass it to Chair McCarthy to start to go through this. Um, please just let me know when to scroll and I'm gonna be taking revision notes here on this. Okay. Oh, yeah. Excellent. You know I'm serious because I put my glasses on. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, I feel like number one should be a no-brainer, and um, it, it says agree, and I think that that makes sense that um, defined terms are capitalized when referred to in the policy. So if everybody can give a thumbs up, thumbs down on this, and we can move to the next one. Um, okay. So number one is out of the way. Okay, number two, definitions. I will speak to this one, uh, Ryan, Recreation Manager. Uh, this was one after, after watching the past meeting about six times uh, and having some conversations with, with Eleanor as well as other, uh, other commissioners, uh, we, did the, we you know, came to the realization it makes sense to include art within the definition of gifts. Uh, so we would be placing, we recommend, uh, staff recommends adding statues, monuments, sculptures, murals, and other works of art within that definition. Um, quite honestly, because I, I think our belief is that anything that would be donated, regardless of, of maybe what we're titling it, should fall within the parameters of this policy. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Okay, um, Commissioner Hay. Yeah, I think that because we say included but not limited to um, in section three, I don't think we need to spell it out. Um, I think that art is a very subjective term and it might mean a painting to one person, a structure to another person, a sculpture to another person. Um, and so, this is a gift policy. And if we just call it a gift, and if this art is a gift, then I think it would be covered under this policy, um, especially because we have but not limited to. So um, I think that by calling it out, we're kind of asking for art in the parks, which um, I don't think is the intention here. So I, I would hesitate to not put that in there. All right. Um... Thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Westberg, do you have something to add towards that? Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is Commissioner Westberg. I, I, um, I don't have a problem with including some reference to um, art in the definition, although I agree that by the language um, that's there to include but not limited to is, is fairly broad. Um, I had a more specific and somewhat Silly question, maybe about a gift of fauna, and if somebody could give me an example of what that might be. Um, well, I think that the flora part of it is like the flower part and fauna. I think of that as being ferns and those kind of plants. Is that what it is? Does it, can you speak to that, <clears throat> Ellen? Ryan? It's a uh, sorry. I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I I believe fauna is more. It's an animal. Animal based. Oh, oh, correct. Well, there you go. <laughs> then, yes, I do. I I'm never a loss for words. <laughs> uh, this is something that was in the previous policy. It's in most. Um, fauna could also I I the. I would I would defer to the commission. I would encourage us to maybe maintain it. I've always said flora and fauna together, but 
I don't really want us in the business of accepting animals. I don't, I don't personally want us in that business, but. Um, well, I only raised the question because I thought you maybe had something in mind. <laughs> I, was, I was having trouble grasping what it might be. Maybe it's that frog. <laughs> Leap? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, while you're doing that, I'm going to go back up to Commissioner Hay to see if she has anything else to add. Rory supported her, um, uh, not but not limited to. Do you have anything else to add, Commissioner Hay? Sorry, that was an old hand. But, okay. but uh, yes, fauna is animals of a particular region. So I'm not, I don't know if we need that in there, unless maybe somebody wanted to donate I, a goldfish pond or something. I, I, I guess in a, uh, I, I guess if I was looking at it, if we had a, and, and I'm way out over my skis here, um, if there was a diminishing population of a specific kind of tree frog or something like that, and an organization wished to donate those to the city because Luther Burbank Park is the ideal habitat and it would benefit our ecological system in some way. That's where I think it would correlate. Um, but that definitely is not my area of expertise. Well, I, I like that you have made Ryan speechless. <laughs> <laughs> um, Commissioner easy to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, Vice Chair Strzok, what would you like to add? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so regarding the, the issue of um, <clears throat> whether to add the, the comment about arts or not to the definition, um, I don't have a strong opinion, but I do think the one perspective that I think including it would be is it, it, it eliminates any ambiguity of where arts should fall. You know, again, on the city right now, we've got a separate arts council and while technically this policy should fall for them as well as anybody else, you know, there might be some, some benefit of just uh, explicitly calling it out that say, yes, art does fall under this. But I do agree with Commissioner Hay that, you know, under the way the wording is uh, under kind of, you know, anything else, it could fall in there too. But that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Commissioner Cohen. Uh, thank you, Don Cohen. I, I agree with Peter, and one of the one of the problems with not putting something in is you do have part of the definition saying or recreation and cultural arts program instruction. So if you don't have the affirmative arts in there, somebody you know in the future could say, uh, you know that was purposeful, despite the in, including but uh, not limited to. So I I kind of favor having some reference. I don't feel strongly about the specifics of the wording. Mm -hmm. On the fauna issue, you know, you don't know what the future might bring. Maybe there will be a decline in, in the beaver population. Mm -hmm. And uh, with good scientific advice, somebody will want to, uh, you know, get a new beaver and somebody, you know, for the wetlands area. I mean, who knows? So I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of just leaving fauna and it doesn't do any harm other than uh, make food for uh, interesting conversation. Yeah, well, I certainly learned uh, a new thing tonight, which I always love learning new things. Um, uh, Commissioner Westberg, did you have anything else to add? Uh, I did not, sorry. And um, I, I certainly can live with keeping fauna in there. It was more a question of curiosity as to what we were trying to say, but uh, no, that's fine. I think, yeah, I think that that was a great question. I'm glad that you brought it up. All right, so we've got, um, we've had some good conversation about this, about um, adding in about the arts and um, we've heard from both sides. So maybe we should do like a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle to see where we're at with that. And okay, everybody who's, who recommends adding it, thumbs up, please. Um, and I will just see if we have a, um, okay, so. I see six. Okay, so that passes. Okay. Okay, so we are on to number three. Okay. 
So, um, okay. The purpose of this, the draft language is, the purpose of this policy is to establish criteria and guidelines for considering and accepting gift proposals of assets, projects, or programs that will, in the judgment of the director, modify park and recreation facilities use, appearance, or overall aesthetics. And the comment is, as, it's, as it is written, this policy would only apply when the director decides to apply it and leaves us with no policy for gifts, which does, do not, in the judgment of the director, modify the use, appearance, or overall aesthetics. And the staff agrees and recommends changing statement to the purpose of this policy is to establish criteria and guidelines for considering and accepting gifts, donor recognition, recognition proposals, and donor recognition objects to the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, all right. Um, does anybody have any comments? Uh, Vice Chair Stark? Yes, this is really more a technical one. So um, right now in the uh, defined terms, uh, donor recognition proposals is not a defined term, so it's projects. So the question is, is that, are we adding a new defined term or do we just make a uh, error or whatever in, in the language? That would be Ryan living off of his past life of old policy. Okay. Right. <laughs> so it should, it, yeah, Eleanor, if you could make that correction. And I, I'm going to guess I probably made it somewhere else as well. I think you did. Okay. All right. Thank you for pointing that out, Vice Chair Strzok. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Hay, for um, helping with changing this language. Um, so if any, if there's no other comments about that, should we do a thumbs up, thumbs down about this one? Um, who agrees with this change? Okay, it looks to me like we got consensus, Ryan. I agree. Okay. Sure. And I, I agree that you had consensus. <laughs> All right, let's go to number four. Okay, suggested update to 1.1. To facilitate and solicit publicly and privately funded gifts and encourage public and private gifts that enhance beauty, improve supplement support, or otherwise benefit the park and recreation system and community of Mercer Island as documented in the city's approved gift needs inventory. Uh, staff response, and I see Commissioner Westberg has his hand up. Did you want to, do you have a comment, Commissioner Westberg? No, I was just gonna say, I agree with the, the proposed change by the committee uh, or by the city staff. My, my intent here was not to restrict the the range of gifts that could be provided to what was in the gifts need inventory, but rather, right. to, but rather to emphasize the fact that if we're going to take the trouble to develop a good gift needs inventory, it should be a centerpiece, perhaps the centerpiece of our giving strategy so that any time a, um, a proposal is made to provide a gift to the city, the first place you look or the first place you go is that inventory. But it was not my intent to restrict uh, the, the full range of gifts that could be provided. All right. So, you, so we're recommending putting the or, including the or as documented in there. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments about this one? I see no hands up. All right. Let's do a thumbs up, thumbs down on this one. I think we got a consensus. Yep. All right, we agree. Let's go on to number five. Okay, so, all right. Um, so this one says to eliminate sections 1.3 because it kind of duplicates what says is said into in 1.2. So, uh, Vice Chair Strzok. Yes, thank you. Um, and just kind of for coming events. So the suggestion I made was that the way the policy is currently written, you have what like section 1.2 says, uh, accept gifts. And then 1.3 says, well, accept donor recognition projects and donor rec recognition objects. And, and here's some criteria for it. 
but it, to me, it was very uh, kind of a little bit awkward, confusing. And so the idea was to collapse them into, into, into one section. But then if you kind of go down to 1.4 and 1.5, there it's the same thing. There it says to limit gifts, limit objects, so forth. Again, we'll see in a second, uh, we want to collapse that. And then in 1.6 1, 1. Um, uh, and 1.7, that's the same thing where you have the two sections. One is reject gifts. The second one is reject objects, et cetera. And again, it would be to put them together. So you'll see all kind of all three aspects there of accept, reject, and limit, um, but just have one section for each. So I, I'm fine with what's suggested. Yeah, I think any time that we can uh, make it as straightforward as possible, um, I'm for that. So that would be do that would be like five, six. Um, I'm just looking at um, an eight. And and I feel like Commissioner Westberg also yeah. is sort of uh, in the same vein. I'm just looking at all of these ones together. Is that is that right? Am I reading this correctly? That that like one like five to eight are kind of all talking about that. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. But I, I I'll defer to, to Rory if he has any more specific comments yeah. or he, on language. Commissioner Cohen has his hand up. So. Well, I want to just make sure that I understand something. I think I do. I talked to Peter and then I talked to Ryan today. As I understand it, you have gifts, and that's what this policy is talking about. Some of those gifts might be money. Some of them might be trees. Some of them might be donor recognition objects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I support the idea of not saying things over and over again unless unless there's something that is important like for example i don't know whether the language in 1.7 is um part of it is repetitious you know inconsistent with the goals and missions and things like that but maybe part of it isn't and i don't know how important it is you know ad advancing the sense of community health wellness and so forth and everything so uh but but i but i support the idea of consolidating these things and somehow making it clear that you know gifts includes a lot of things including these other things and and it's not really separate unless it says there are separate criteria that would apply okay thank you for that commissioner cohen commissioner westberg uh this is commissioner westberg i was just going to make this statement that i agreed with generally your summary jody and with the intent to try to simplify the language by combining uh, references to all of the uh, things that we're talking about in this policy under a single statement. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Burstein. This is Paul Burstein. Um, I want to understand the intent of 1.4. Um, I'm not sure why we would want to limit as much as possible things that complement a proposed location. Any um, further background to to why we'd want to limit that? Yeah, it's it. The wording is um, to uh, to limit to the extent possible all gifts to items that complement the proposed location. So we're limiting it to items that are complementary instead of limiting complementary items. Oh, okay, okay. So I, this is Ryan, Recreation Manager. Uh, to, I had an excellent conversation with uh, Commissioner Cohen earlier, who is, we were discussing the Luther Burbank dock area. Um, and so a, a gift that may be appropriate there would be a financial gift toward uh, maybe a bench in that area um, that, that meets the needs there. That would be complementary to that location. The donation of a basketball hoop to that location, even though there's a nice paved surface, would not be complementary to that. So, so if you kind of think about it in that term, that that might be helpful. 
Okay, but in a area where there is a basketball court, donation of a new backboard and net. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And, and um, if I may have follow up with that, there may be, and I think there already are cases, especially in the the ball fields where there are storage areas where different mm -hmm. clubs have been able to keep equipment for their club use. Does this policy address or limit the ability for groups to um, create an area where they may store equipment? It, I'm thinking it, so as an example, to clarify, let's say the Mercer Island um, Soccer Association, I don't know what it's called, mm -hmm. um, said, you know, rather than putting equipment in coaches and referees' homes, we're going to get a metal box and we're going to store balls, yep. nets, cones, and all the equipment that's needed there. It's not really um, available for broad public use. Somebody has to have access to that that belongs to that association. So that would that would not fall under this policy. That would fall under um, uh, athletic field use policy more than likely. Um, now, if that donation that you're talking about was donated to the city, not for their exclusive use, and we were managing that facility, thinking about the batting cage, for example, right. um, it's open to the public. Uh, we're controlling the access and making that available. So, so in that aspect, it it would it would be appropriate under this policy great all right thank you if it meets the characteristics and the usability of that facility right okay uh commissioner westberg uh thank you i'm just wondering why uh, this is on 1.4 again why we are stating this to limit as much as possible since it's our policy why can't we just make the statement that that the policy would be to ensure that uh, that gifts, all gifts complement the proposed location, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Why is there a limit? Why would we state this as a limit to the extent possible? It's It should be an affirmative uh, statement that says that this is what we will take or accept. So I can speak to that. Um, a good example of something that may be accepted that doesn't meet the location's characteristics would be a replacement of that of that area's needs. So replacing a tennis court with a pickleball court, for example, if that was something that the city was encouraged to do, um, and then it was accepting items that don't necessarily meet the current tennis need, but meets the new pickleball need this wording would allow for that instead. I think that's the, the discussion that me and Ryan had. But it's still complementary to the location. I mean, it's you're not proposing to, to take a, you know, an, an athletic facility out and replace it with a goldfish pond. I think on, on this one, I would, I, I would be open to commission input if if they want if you wanted to change it to an affirmative statement. Um, I think that would be appropriate. I'm going to try to poke holes in it while I'm thinking about it, though. <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Hay, what would you like to add? So I agree with these comments about 1.4, and I'm looking at 1.6 and seeing that we're being redundant by kind of saying the same thing here to limit as much as possible all gifts to items that complement the proposed location in 1.4. And then in 1.6, we say to reject gifts that in the judgment of the director are incompatible with the park or facility location. Those are kind of the same thing, if I'm reading that correctly. And if we could combine this to an acceptance policy rather than a limiting or rejection policy, we can probably combine those two. If I'm reading that correctly, do those have the same intention and meaning 1.4 and 
I definitely always think that positive is uh, better than um, negative. Um, Commissioner Cohen, what would what do you have to say? Uh, thank you, Don Cohen. Well, the only thing I was thinking of, even though I generally agree with the, the conversation, is what if a major donation were offered, huge, and and it and it wasn't uh, it wasn't comfortably complimentary. I, I can't even think of what it might be, but uh, at least uh, the as much as possible gives some flexibility. Maybe there's some flexibility somewhere else. That was that was the thing I could think of. I didn't think of the example that, uh, that uh, Eleanor mentioned, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I feel like we're getting we're circling around and we're getting close to getting a consensus here that we want these statements to be in the positive as much as possible. Um, yeah, and to try and to con and also slash consolidate so we're not repeating ourselves. Um, okay, so going back to number five, um, we definitely I, we all agree on eliminating one point three. I um, vice chair struck. Yes, thank you. Um... Yeah, I think we've got a good discussion going here. And as I think of, look at re, kind of rereading re the language. So, you know, 1.6 um, starts out to reject yes. Um, and then if you go back to 1.2, it says to accept only those gifts. And that's kind of saying the same thing, just one from a positive, quasi positive perspective versus or affirmative versus negative. So I'm always coming to the conclusion that 1.2 through 1.7 probably call them almost be all collapsed into one and just saying we accept only those gifts you know we, we may limit them we may reject them but we only accept these and here's the parameters for accepting them <clears throat> the only reason why i think you wouldn't want to do that is is you know by by explicitly saying well yeah we are going to reject gifts and so forth it perhaps you know, gives staff a little bit stronger position, when, you know, when they have to reject They're saying, hey, you know, see in the policy, it says we reject stuff. I would also just add that 1.2 speaks more so to uh, planning documents. Um, 1.6 speaks more to the actual facilities. So just, just highlighting that, that... Okay. Yep, the, no, the, depart, the department director would, it's an easy one for a department director to go, oh, you want to put a pickleball court in the middle of Pioneer Park. That is incompatible. And it's incompatible with the uses. So that, that goes away. Yeah. And that's why you only see a couple of reject statements in the document because it... Mm -hmm. Most of most of the uh, the verbiage is to limit to or something along those lines, which um, allows for a little bit of opportunity, uh, or at least allows for that. As Commissioner Cohen was saying, you know, a, something maybe we're not even thinking about. It allows still for that, but when we say we're going to reject something, it's it's pretty pretty hardened. Okay, so can we get a consensus? Um on we're going to um, eliminate 1.3, first of all, and then uh, we can like streamline. So we get a thumbs up, thumbs down on that. And then we'll get to your comment, Commissioner Cohen, on uh, eliminate 1.3. And I think um, we have a consensus on that or no? How many do you have? Yes, you do. Okay, so we're going to eliminate 1.3. So I think that's good that we're going to do that. Um, Commissioner Cohen. Uh, yes, Don Cohen. I, I'm convinced now that uh, as much as possible is not uh, the, the way to go on this. If, if there's a major gift, it ought to be accepted uh, and the gifter ought to uh, bear in mind the compatibility with the location and purpose and everything like that. So I... I, I'm changing my mind on this. I don't. I kind of agree with uh, Peter that 
to accept only those gifts is better language than to reject, but I don't feel strongly about that one. Okay. Yeah, I do feel like people should work a little bit in in our sandbox mm -hmm. um, on that. Okay, so we've taken away 1.3 and then um, going back and... Okay, and... and just uh, clarity on 1.2 on item number five above. Yes, I wanted to go back to that. Really. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the one I'm kind of struggling with, with 1.2, yeah. 1.3. Yeah. Okay. And so instead of having the long, is this instead of having the long list of things, this is to just have 1.2 now say this, is that what we're going to? instead of having all of the um, exceptions to 1.2 or like the 1.21, blah, blah, blah. If that's the suggested revision that the commission wants to go towards, we can have that in here. Okay, so just uh, Vice Chair Stark. Wait a minute, yeah, I, this is Don Cohen. Aren't we talking about just substituting for the first paragraph of 1.2? Isn't that what we're talking about here? Yeah, that, that's my, my thought. Oh, okay, Don, yes. all right, that's yeah. what I thought. We okay, weren't talking good. about I just wanted to make sure that, that, that that's yeah. what we were talking right. about. Okay, and, and that's what you wanted to say, um, Vice Chair Stark? Yeah, I, I have another thought, but let's stay on, on this. Okay, so we're staying point. on number five. Okay, and so this is to just... Um, change the opening paragraph of 1.2, not the whole of 1.2, um, to accept only those gifts, donor recognition projects and donor recognition objects, which are consistent with the mission policies, park property restrictions, park master plans, and most current parks, recreation, and open space plan and associated trail plans of the Mercer Island Parks and Recreation Department and the mission and policies of it, its assigned advisory boards, commissions, councils, or groups. All right, so that is to replace what it currently says. Um, okay, do we have a consensus on that? Um, okay, we have a consensus on that. So that is changing the opening sentence of, sorry, paragraph or whatever. Okay, 1.7, or sorry, round to number seven. Okay. Um, was this the one, Vice Chair Struck, that you wanted to talk about or that you had a thought about? Um, well, yeah, so, so my thought was um, kind of, again, stepping back a little bit. And I, I, what I want to do is ask uh, Roy or Eleanor staff, um, if we were to eliminate 1.4 and 1.5 the, to limit piece and just say we've got an affirmative 1.2 says accept, blah, blah, blah. And then if we wanted to keep in a reject statement, does that does that work for you, or do you really need that kind of middle we limit aspect in it? Um, this is Commissioner Westberg. That works for me. I think if we have a broad a, a statement that's broad enough, and if we need to add to one point two something that addresses uh, facility characteristics or park characteristics, that would cover it completely. And then we wouldn't have a need for those other limiting statements. I, I would agree with that as well. Okay, Commissioner Cohen. Uh, yes, Don Cohen. I, I'm not sure I followed clearly what Rory just said, but I I thought that was something that Ryan said earlier made sense that 1.2 speaks to various policies and plans some of these other ones speak to the actual physical characteristics of a location. Is that what you were saying, Rory, that you, if you could import that into 1.2 or something, is that what Yeah, I was saying if, if that's a, if there was an intention to draw a distinction between plans and actual facility characteristics uh, by having separate statements, you could simply add to 1.2 language that says, um, park and recreation facilities characteristics uh, or something to that effect. And that would then cover both uh, planning documents as well as actual on the ground conditions. 
and then you wouldn't need uh, one four or one five. Um, Commissioner Hay. I like that suggestion to put it up in 1.2 and then we can make it an affirmative statement and cover those facilities and you know 1.4 I guess that would be 1.4 1.5 and possibly 1.6 right am I getting that right but I like that idea of putting it up there and making an affirmative statement and being able to eliminate eliminate some of these below Yeah, I like that too. Uh, Commissioner Burstein. Um, I wonder, this is Paul Burstein, I wonder if we should still keep some of the specific examples from 1.4. I agree we could drag that up to 1.2. Um, my concern would be if the statement is too vague and it says all gifts to items that complement the proposed location, I can imagine um perhaps some citizens objections because they feel the area is beautiful and what is proposed is ugly mm -hmm. without it being specific to the location in use okay so if we take these up i feel i don't know i feel like we could still have examples if in 1.2, you know, if it's being a little bullet point under 1.2 and just um, scooch those up into there um, for the policy. Is there a reason, Ryan and Eleanor, why we made them and took them outside of the 1.2, which is talking about the gifts to uh, make? Primarily because of the difference between location and uh, master plan. Um, and then when you're talking about characteristics of parks, that sort of differentiates from uh, consistent with mission policies, park restriction, or property restrictions. So so I guess it, it's just speaking to something different. I, I would be, you know, from a from a readability standpoint, Personal, my, and this is this is more Ryan's personal opinion of who he. Is. I I like seeing things in maybe more bullet point or individual sentences than than a paragraph. Um, which which one point two may turn into if we start combining a lot of those elements. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm probably more supportive of the changing language to uh, the affirmative. Mm -hmm um in those scenarios i think i think 1.4 could be that um because it does read sort of circular in 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 the way it's written yeah. um something along the lines of you know to accept to accept gifts which complement the proposed location eg all the way through something along those lines i I am a positive individual, so I, I I do agree with with all of you on that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's important to to call out separately the characteristics of a park um, from what you know from from including that with the master plan or things of that nature. So that's that's just my rationale for it, but i'm I'm comfortable with um, with the commission's direction on this one. Commissioner Cohen. Don Cohen, I, I would defer to Ryan on that one. And I kind of feel the same way now that we've talked around it. it I think it, it will be easier to implement if it's there separate. Uh, and if you use the kind of language he was talking about, I think the gist of the discussion was to have the word only in there also, mm -hmm. um, not just to accept uh, those gifts, but only sort of like the language of one point two that would uh, then link into either the language in uh, 
uh, 1.4, but, uh, you know, with the affirmative rather than the yeah. limited, you know, as much as possible stuff, um, or 1.6, so. So you could almost combine 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6 into an affirmative statement. Yeah. Is that... I, I'm seeing. Does that sound uh, like what the commission's desire is? Because I'm, I can see that being written as a very easy statement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like okay. that. Let's have a thumbs up, thumbs down on combining and doing to the affirmative. Um, yeah. And you're talking one four, one five, and one six. Just yeah. for clarification. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, Commissioner Hay. Would we also put 1.7 in there? Because I was we, to you. So one four, one five, one six, one seven as a separate bullet point, making it an affirmative statement rather mm -hmm. than reject and limit. This one, I I would maybe push back on um, just a little bit from staff's point of view. This is our, um, this is really our ability to recognize something that doesn't belong in a park, um, whether it be a donor recognition object or the gift that doesn't, doesn't fit with our sense of community. Um, if you say it only if it, to accept only gifts, which advance a sense of community health and wellness that's a little bit different than rejecting those that don't mm -hmm. if, if that kind of makes sense uh council member reynolds was talking a little bit about this at the last meeting uh mm -hmm. in regards to consistent with or not inconsistent with um that kind of verbiage so that, that's that's just where my feel falls on this one okay so, yeah so that makes a lot of sense because also one four five and six are more about the location and facility Whereas one seven sounds more like a guiding principle. Yes. So, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's then, so tackling this, let's um, give thumbs up, thumbs down on combining and doing to the affirmative on um, one four, one five, and one six. Okay. Okay, I see agree. So that uh, is like. So Eleanor, go ahead and make a note in that box for um, on where you're at that we'll be combining those in the affirmative. And that was one, four, one, five, and one, six. Yeah, and that kind of speaks to item six and seven, correct? And eight, those are the ones that we're talking about. In terms of items. And then, um, and then on nine, which is a, a quick one, um, Vice Chair Struck has got change in the second sentence, replace may with would most or like most likely um, um, require additional community engagement. So yeah, ch change may to would um, as part of that. Commission uh, Vice Chair Struck. Yeah. Yeah, I had said would would most likely, but the staff has suggested just using the term would um, and dropping the most likely, and that's fine. Yeah. It just creates a, a little bit uh, higher kind of threshold to require uh, community engagement right, in my the language. Yeah. St staff is very supportive of that. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's a pretty solid statement right there by adding would. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Hay? Yeah, I just had a comment as we combine this 1.4, 5, and 6. 
um, will we have a chance to review that combined bullet point um, tonight or at a future date? That would be up to the commission. If you choose to endorse the policy elements tonight, um, you would see it again. You, you're going to see this policy probably annually, in all honesty. Um, but if you chose not to endorse tonight, we could bring it back with that language. So the reason I ask is because um, 1.6 uses the term in the judgment of the director, 1.4 and 1.5 do not use that term. Mm -hmm. But as, as it applies to, as we are applying 1.4 or 1.5, wouldn't it be the judgment of the director also? It's pretty much all the judgment of the director. Right. So yeah. um, I question if we want to, I mean, do we actually need to include that if that is um, what all of this, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Is that what this policy comes down to? Um, because we list that phrase in some of these bullet points and we don't in others. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we're keeping it in that section or eliminating it. I think we, when we were going over the policy, Ryan, we chose to keep it um, with statements that are hard reject statements um, as they'd be judged as a rejection by the director, whereas the limiting statements are not a rejection statement. So we didn't include that. That's true. Okay, so then if we combined one four and one five and one six, then yes, would it take out the judgment one for the rejecting the gifts that are incompatible? But then we still have one seven that is um, is a is a, at the judgment of the director, Commissioner Cohen. Yeah, Don Cohen. Well, I think Ashley makes a good point here because you look at uh, the old 1.3 at least, and it had as, as determined. Why wouldn't we just why wouldn't we eliminate those as determined by the director and dump that into the procedures? That the procedures for determining these things yeah. are, you know, the director makes the decision, and if there's an appellate procedure in there, fine. Then that takes care of it and it doesn't open it up to mischief of interpretation like uh, Ashley commented yeah. on. I'm comfortable with that. Yes. Okay, so where does that leave us then on these? Somebody's popping up uh, fireworks or something around my house. Um, Okay, so then what does that mean in terms of the combining the 1415 and 16 for us now? Uh, Commissioner Westberg. Well, I'm answering your question. And Go where ahead. I think it leaves us is that we're in agreement to do that. We're going to turn the statement. So we're going to combine those three bullets. We're going to we're going to eliminate any reference to um as uh, in the judgment of the director, we're going to eliminate mm -hmm. that language, and we're going to turn this statement into an affirmative rather than the sort of awkward language that we had before about limiting as much as possible, yada, yada. So I think that's where we're at. Okay, very good. Thank you for um, summoning that up for us. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Oh, uh, one recommendation I might have is where it says, if we turn it all into an affirmative statement and you have such gifts may require additional community engagement and verifiable demonstration of community support, it's that it doesn't quite fit <laughs> there. Um, though it's an important statement to make. So I'm just, I'm wondering if it's an additional bullet that should be added. Well, isn't that a proceed, a process item too that could be, that could yeah. be cr cranked into that? If, if the commission's comfortable with that, I, I, we, it could be one of the procedural elements. I, this Don Cohen, I've got another idea. Maybe it's not so good. 
why, why maybe we could dump uh, that concept from the last sentence of 1.5 into 1.9. So to solicit and provide mm -hmm. community engagement, et cetera, on things not in the needs inventory, not in the adopted city budget, or uh, you know, gifts uh, that involve installations that detract from the characteristics, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Then you have community engagement, uh, making a strong statement and cover and covering three or four different, uh, you know, circumstances. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Strzok. Yeah, you know, so I would I would agree with uh, Commissioner Cohen's uh, comment there. I, I think from a policy perspective, I think it's very important that we have the concept or policy of com community uh, engagement. You know, mm -hmm. kind of in this policy. And you know maybe some of the details can go to procedures, but I think it's a policy statement. We want to be there, be in there. And I think uh, Don's suggestion to to kind of embellish 1.9 um, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Hay, do you agree with that? I was going to say that I like that suggestion to put it in 1.9, so that this would apply to gifts which are not identified within the gift needs inventory or do not meet the criteria listed above or something like that. Okay, um, yeah, I think that makes sense to move that, to move that statement down to 1.9. So we're gonna take that out of 1.5, our squished uh, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, and put it down into 1.9 so that we can uh, make this into the affirmative. Um, all right, let's get a consensus on that. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, Eleanor, did that all track? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm making comments on the actual policy document because yeah. it okay. might not fit here in the matrix. Yeah. But I did track it. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. And so that would include changing that may to a would so that. Um, yep. Okay. Good. I like that one. That yep. excellent, excellent combination there. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people here. <laughs> really good suggestions. Okay. So that gives us. Okay. So that was nine. Okay. And then we're on to number 10 now. Okay. Okay. This is, this is so, Commissioner Westberg. Jody, yes. I think we're actually down to number 13. Okay, awesome. Good. I'm trying to keep track. My printer um, makes it very confusing for me to, because it flips them back and forth. It's, um, okay, so we're on to 13. Okay. Recommend removing section 1.11 in order to have a stronger, more concise policy. Okay. And staff recommends it too. Um, okay, so I gotta get back to where I am for one one. All right, are we all in agreement about taking out section 1.11? Any comments on this section that anybody wants to make? And if we if we take it out, then we don't have to do 14 either. Actually, we got a lot of things about it, 14, 15. All right. Uh, it looks like lots of people support taking out 111. So thumbs up, thumbs down on that one, taking out section 1.11. Okay. I'm seeing a consensus of thumbs. Okay. And then number 16 is from Commissioner Cohen. And this is about taking, um, uh, 
Um, you know what? I'm kind of confused about this one. So Eleanor, can you speak to this or Commissioner Cohen? Uh, I just want to make sure we're talking about the right one. Is this referring to the last item? This one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so this I, is talking. I can I can say this one real fast here. Okay. The the part that I found confusing was the last sentence in the proposal that says following approval of the policy. Uh, I don't I don't mind having something that says that procedures will be developed to implement the uh, implement this policy, but saying follow the policy is going to be adopted by the time you uh, start doing it. So it just didn't read, uh, you know. Uh, it just didn't read quite right. Okay, perfect. And that will be changed. Okay. Perfect. All right. So I feel like we worked through all of the questions and comments. Commissioner Cohen? Oop, no, sorry. Mistake. Okay. All right, so now the big question is, do we feel comfortable uh, endorsing this um, policy and putting it towards um, for the uh, city council to, um, yeah, sorry, recommend endorsing it. Commissioner Hay. I think we need to revisit 1.9 where we are going to move the community engagement from 1.5 down to that area. Hey, Eleanor, can you share your screen with the with the um, policy on it now with the changes that we've made, please? Thank you. And one additional comment about that updated section 1.9. Because in 1.2, we adopted the language of gifts, donor recognition projects, donor recognition objects, we would want to also put that in 1.9 okay. so that we're consistent. Okay, very good. We did that for 1.2, correct? Yeah. Okay. I have too many pieces of paper. All right, so we're going to be. When you're ready, I have a comment on what Ashley okay. just said. Yeah, Commissioner Cohen, go ahead. Oh, Don Cohen, uh, Ashley's comment forced me to look back at the end of 1.5. Yep. Because, because 1.5 requires a verifiable demonstration of community support for things that detract, okay? So the idea that I proposed of just dumping that uh, concept of things that don't, uh, that aren't compatible, et cetera, into 1.9 mm -hmm. doesn't quite get that strong because it just says to provide community engagement and input opportunities. It doesn't mm -hmm. say that if it's inconsistent with uh, the, the area that there has to be verifiable community support. I don't know how the commission feels about that or whether that difference is one that is an important one, but uh, I see that it's a difference. Got it. Okay. Vice Chair Struck. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, we have made so many changes to the policy tonight, unless there's a compelling reason from staff that, you know, they need to get it endorsed tonight to get to, you know, uh, council sometime in November. Um, I would strongly prefer to see a, another draft and hopefully, you know, it'll, everything will kind of work, work out, but I just mm -hmm. think that there, there could be some things still kind of that when, once we see it, we say, oh, th did we really mean that? So anyway, that's my thought. Yes. Thank you. Um, Eleanor, so you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that possibly moving, um, uh, including this does not meet criteria um community engagement statement maybe as a sub bullet of 1.9 mm. that could be an option as well to consider right um okay so can you do the changes that we have talked about on this so that we can see it um is that possible right now or is that 
too much. Um, I can do rough statements. It, 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 it to yeah. combine a bunch might be a lot. I'm, I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> I might suggest, um, along with Commissioner or Vice Chair Strzok's comments, uh, and and you'll recall a couple meetings ago, I said we are not in a hurry, and we really aren't. Um, getting this right is more important, and and doing so in a uh, a manageable fashion that the commission and staff are comfortable with. I don't want, I don't necessarily want to put Ellen or myself in the position of trying to rush this through uh, this meeting when we had excellent input. So um, what what maybe I would suggest is that um, staff return in, at the December meeting for a I would imagine I should never say it probably a very brief conversation with these updates. Yep. Um, that the commission would then, you know, you would be able to review those ahead of that meeting. Obviously, um, we can continue to have the individual conversations to make sure we're getting it right. Um, I can review statements made from this meeting mm -hmm. just to get it all buttoned up and and wrap wrap the year up in the right way. So yeah. that would be supportive of that. I like it, Commissioner Hay. I was going to agree with um, <laughs> Commissioner Struck that yep. we yep. should review this. And I was going to suggest some possible wording for 1.9 rather than doing a bullet point, but we can address that at a later date if we're going to have a second review of this. Yeah, I think that sounds awesome. Commissioner Cohen. Oh, just uh, one question. The, the material that Eleanor typed in in yellow, is that what somebody had previously suggested may should be wood or is that was that a different one? Yeah, that's the one where we changed it to wood. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Vice Chair Strzok. Yeah, I was just going to request that if we are, it sounds like we're going to bring this back to the December meeting. Mm -hmm. If staff could provide us with a red line from this draft that was presented and then kind of a, a you know, so we can kind of track where the changes went and so forth. I think Got that would it. be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I like that. All right, so we're going to um, come back to this again in, at the December meeting uh, with all of the changes that we talked about tonight because it was it is quite substantial mm -hmm. what we have uh, done, um, and uh, it'll be refreshed and a uh, more positive uh, policy, Commissioner Hay. I just had one final comment that didn't make it onto the matrix, but that I think we should include in the final draft. And that would be an additional bullet point to determine the cost to maintain the gift prior to accepting it. That would fall under procedures. Um, and we're actually gonna discuss that next as one of our questions to the commission about determining that cost as well. Excellent. All right. Well, let's is, yep. sorry, just to jump in one one more time on on Commissioner Hayes um, suggestion. I do think it might be appropriate to include a policy statement. Something along the lines of. I don't, I don't know, reject. And, and here's negative, Ryan, I guess, but reject those donation or those gifts, which would, I don't know, I, Commissioner Strzok, I might ask for your help on this one because you and I talked about this earlier. Um, I think it might be prudent to include a statement that, that demonstrates financial responsibility or something along those lines. Um, I can think about it and bring something forward um, ahead of the next meeting, or if, or if any of you have have a suggestion, that would be helpful. Yeah, this is Vice Chair Strzok. Um, yeah, I think fiscal responsibility or financial responsibility is a good one, and I do agree with Ashley that yeah, you know, there there should be a policy statement along those lines. Um, you know, and again, I'll lead you to the word lead you to the wordsmithing, but something like you know where where appropriate you know projects should be you know, fully costed out to include, you know, operational expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just stating that we need to be aware of that um, idea, because I think as we talked that it's real easy to 
to raise dollars for capital, but then it's that operational ongoing maintenance issue that can kind of come back to bite you at, at some point in the future. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, all right. So was there um, more um, things that you wanted to talk about, Eleanor, with the procedural elements? All right. Yeah, we're going to jump right into the development of the procedures. Um, the development process um, is usually a staff responsibility. Um, however, we'd like import from the Citizen Advisory Board um, to help kind of address community needs, of course. Um, so this will be a very open discussion. Uh, we did build some guiding questions to help. So we're going to step through those pretty quickly and just um, hope to gather some feedback through that discussion. shuffle around here a bit. So our first question was, should the level of community engagement differ depending on the size or type of gift? Does anybody have any comments? I'll just highlight that we're, we're thinking about those gifts which aren't on the gift inventory or gift needs inventory. Uh, these would be those ones that just sort of pop up. Commissioner Westberg. Uh, well, my two cents worth is yes. The level of community engagement may well differ depending on the size and type of gift, what's being proposed, where it's being proposed. Um, yeah, a whole variety of things could enter into it. Thank you, Vice Chair Strzok. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with what Rory said. Also, I think about we should be cognizant that, you know, there is a cost of community engagement. And so that does suggest that it would be gifts probably um, of a more material size, you know, whether we have a dollar threshold, 25,000 and above or something like that, that's not on the, the gift inventory uh, list and so forth, or it's something that's a new activity or it's unique or something like that. Um, but again, I think that there has to be a balancing so that, um, you know, we're, we're we we kind of, we we choose we choose wisely. Let me just put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's good. Another consideration would be the size of the object that as well. Um, <laughs> if it's going to be a um, yeah, really a tiny little thing, do we really need community engagement? But if it's the batting cages size, mm -hmm. yes, I feel like probably we want to have. Um, community engagement on that. All right, next thing. Uh, is the commission supportive of a more automated process of gift, gift solicitation and acceptance and the encouragement of staff uh, to identify and advertise gift opportunities? And I'll just, I'll, I'll preface this question a little bit. Uh, past history, your, your staff did a lot of back and forth um even on the on what i would classify as maybe the more simple donations like a bench just working through that plaque what we're moving toward as a division is a more um standardized and automated process and and would like to see if that's something the commission um supports as a direction commissioner hay i would say yes and that the gift needs inventory could be be part of something that we review annually mm -hmm to help identify locations for gifts, types of gifts. I agree with that too. Uh, Commissioner Cohen. Yes, Don Cohen. I, I agree with it, certainly from the point of view of solicitation and advertising. Acceptance, you know, depends, <laughs> you know. I think if something's on our gift, um, in lists, our list of accepted gifts, then that could be uh, more automated um, for sure. Uh, Commissioner Westberg. Yeah, I fully agree with Jody what you just said. I was going to say this seems particularly appropriate um, automating and um, 
uh, identifying and advertising opportunities for items that are on the, the gift inventory. So I would definitely support it in that context. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Strzok. Yeah, I, I would agree as well. I, I think about it in two ways. One, I think if it is automated uh, for kind of those standard gifts that probably are in the inventory and so forth, it makes it easier for our residents to do it. Mm -hmm. They don't have to say, oh gosh, I've you know, got to write a five page uh, memo to, you know, why I want to do this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think, I think that, that that makes it that makes it better, and then I think it's it's also easier uh, as I think Ryan alluded to for staff to to handle most of it. And I suspect it's a 80-20 type of rule where 80% of the gifts will probably fall under this some type of automated process, and it's just the very large ones that are would still need to be kind of done on a kind of one off basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hay. One additional comment about automating the process is that it makes it much easier when there are projects that come up that have an opportunity for citizens to buy a brick or mm -hmm. a paver. Um, you can say, we've got 200 pavers. Here you go, put it in the cart, buy it. What do you want on the um, inscription? And it makes it much, much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Don Cohen. Well, Ryan. So for example, let's say there's a bench in a particular location on the gift needs inventory and somebody uh, automated in an automated fashion says, I'll contribute the $3,500 or whatever it is. But then there's an, then they want to, uh, I'm not criticizing this, then they want to have some recognition on there and they get into a discussion of wording. So that, yep. that can't be resolved totally automatedly, right? No, no, that would be, um... Okay. That there's there's going to going to be with anything that goes into our park system an approval. Um, yeah, you, you can't just put anything you want. But pushing that through to say the shopping cart and pushing that to staff for a review would be almost a seamless process. Um, you know, you think about customizing a T-shirt or something like that on Amazon or or wherever you're doing. It. I would see a similar process. But before we move to contacting the vendor there's that approval that goes in the middle. And, and as you mentioned, um, the location sites would be, I, I'm looking at that being identified location sites. Things outside of those locations would need to go through maybe a bit separate of a request process that we would need to uh, have additional review on. Commissioner Burstein. Uh, this is Paul Bursting. So rather than solicitation and acceptance, maybe sol solicitation and review. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and if we have a needs list that people can go down to see, um, and they want people want to support those, I feel like, yeah, that. And, and this is where we fall in short. It, it, in all honesty, we're behind on what other cities are doing. There's so many examples out there that we can do better. Um, and this is a focus for us in 23. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, what's the next one? Um, should an appeal slash reapplication process be established? And should the Parks and Recreation Commission be a part of the appeal slash reapplication process? Mm -hmm. So these are for one um, request that have not been uh, approved? Right. Yeah, let me provide a maybe an example. Um, this is items outside of the gift needs inventory. <clears throat> this would be Commissioner Cohen wishing to put a basketball hoop down at Luther Burbank Park, which is denied because it does not fit with the uh, characteristics of the park. And that decision is made at the director level. Commissioner Cohen is upset about that and wants to uh, appeal that decision uh, and reapply. Uh, the question we're asking is, should the Parks and Recreation uh, Commission be a party to that, um, I guess, reviewing the director's decision if desired by the donor? Uh, Vice Chair Strzok. Uh, Ryan, just a, a, vice, uh, a clarifying question to your example. Um, under the current 
procedures if the city or the director denies something like, like the example you gave what recourse if any does there does the individual have at this point at this point they would go back to the director um and and keep <laughs> essentially uh requesting for them to change their decision um oftentimes those those situations um may end up at the council level uh with council members being contacted by the individual or or parks commissioners in in that matter in a uh outside of the process um application so if i could do a quick follow-up two questions um one, can you give us a sense of how many rejections kind of quote unquote are appealed back to to staff? And then, um, uh, oh, secondly, would you would you or would staff find it beneficial to have an appeals process that kind of moves the decision kind of out of your uh, scope of authority? Thank you. Uh, to answer your first question, we honestly don't get a lot of donation requests that are outside of a division need or a department need, I should say. The majority of the requests come through, you know, 80%, 90% of them are donations that we're going to take seriously and, and probably look for an opportunity. So that 10% that um, of those that actually get declined, they probably return to the director or the staff member at some point um requesting you know a second opinion i guess um i can't think of an example offhand that, that that's moved forward uh after being declined however it does eat up a significant amount of staff time dealing or addressing that um I, unofficial reapplication and relationship that then is is maybe a bit frayed um so the last part of your question is do i think that um utilizing the parks and recreation commission to assist in an appeal process if that would be beneficial i i, I would need to think about it i i think that maybe a subcommittee of the parks and recreation commission to provide additional feedback to the director as part of that process maybe maybe the best way to go. I don't believe putting that in front of the full Parks and Recreation Commission would be a benefit to the community though. Okay, that's good input. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Don Cohen, if you haven't had the opportunity uh, to re re discuss this with the city attorney, right. you, might wanna, you might wanna do that because yes. you may be implicating uh, uh, procedural requirements, this and that, inconsistencies with uh, other uh, boards and commissions and all that. I, I don't know what the answer is, but that jumps out at me very clearly. That absolutely where my mind is as well. Perfect. Uh, Commissioner Burstein. Um, I think that if a situation were to occur where the director was adamant that um, the donation was not acceptable, and it was thrown to the Parks and Rec Commission, it seemed like it would be an unnecessary source of friction between mm -hmm. us and the director, because ultimately the director is gonna make a decision, it's out of our hands, and the one that might have the ultimate authority would be the city council. So rather than have it as a um, part of the appeal reapplication process, I would like to think that the director may want to have an opinion, as was stated, from a subcommittee mm -hmm. of the Parks and Rec Commission, but it's at their option, because I, I think it's a no-win situation if their feet are dug in and they do not want this, and we come back and say, no, you should do this or you must do this, the director is still going to say no. I would I would add to that. In, in most scenarios, the donation would likely be in excess of $10,000 because I'm, I'm assuming it's a some sort of a large object that, that we're yeah. turning down. Yeah. 
in that case, it has to be approved by the city council anyways. Uh, in that situation, I do foresee a recommendation coming from the full Parks and Recreation Commission to the city council, uh, whether or not to accept that donation. Okay, um, I'm going to jump to Commissioner Markson because she has not made any comments yet tonight. Thanks. Um, this is Commissioner Markson. <clears throat> I just I, maybe I now just learned something from what Ryan said that will change what I'm going to say. So let me make sure I understood. Ryan, you're saying that because um, I really like Commissioner Burstein's idea that you know if the director wanted input or input on this reapplication or whatever it was denied from the commission that she she or he could do that, but then that it would really be up to the council to make the ultimate decision the council or the director to make the ultimate decision. I, I liked that approach, but you're saying, I think you're suggesting that that's gonna happen anyway, because under a lot of these cases, cause they're very um, high monetary value projects. Is that what you're suggesting? That that pr approach already will happen? Exactly, where, where that would deviate in current practice is works of art. Uh, works of art, whether it be a photograph or a substantial statue, are accepted at the city council level, and the arts council um, makes a recommendation every time on whether or not to accept that. Okay. Yeah. So then what Commissioner Burstein suggested <clears throat> would be similar to what the arts council does as an advisory yes. role. To, okay. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Westberg. Uh, this is Commissioner Westberg. I'm just, uh, I'm, I agree with what uh, Commissioner Cohen said. I think uh, you need to look very carefully at uh, what the um, roles and role and responsibility of the commission is. I think it would be a slippery slope to get the commission involved in any kind of a uh, decision-making process that, as Commissioner Burstein suggested, would be a losing proposition all the way around. Essentially, our role is as advisory, and would um, it would need to stay advisory uh, in any uh, such process um, as we've been discussing. So, um, I I would tread very carefully. Okay, Commissioner Hay. Just a thought that I might broaden this to a review slash appeal slash reapplication process. Because we review as a commission what you put in front of us and that process for what you decide to put in front of us or not. Um, it might be beneficial to have that detailed in a process. And it might also be a useful tool if something is put in front of you that you think, oh, I really would like feedback on this. I don't want to be the sole person to make this decision. And I'd like some input. Um, so it, those are typically the things that I think you would put in front of us. Um, but making that part of the process and then within that, there would be some sort of potential appeal or reapplication process that we would advise on if desired. Um, just, a, just a thought. So starting to play into that community engagement portion, it feels like. I, I see the Parks Commission as, as the hub of engagement and forum. Right, and as part of that review process um, so that if something were to need an appeal or a reapplication um, that would be um, it, that would have already been reviewed by mm -hmm. more people than you to um, make that decision. So it kind of um, takes that pressure off of the plate of one person making a choice, which would then need to trigger some larger process of appeal and reapplication. So it might it might eliminate the need for that process if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, yes, Don Cohen. Uh, the difference is if it's a formal appeal process, then right. it's gonna implicate a bunch of things. I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident it might even require 
amending the charter, the ordinance uh, under which the, the Parks and Rec Commission operates. And for uh, a number of us who have served on different bodies, uh, whether it's the Planning Commission, the Open Space Conservancy Trust, maybe I don't know if the Arts Commission does this also, where you do have formal appeal processes, it's, it could be really time consuming and not a very happy uh, outcome most of the time for the reasons that everybody has, has said that deference to the director and the staff. So, uh, but so anyway, I, I don't disagree with uh, engaging with the director, engaging if the director feels that's appropriate to talk to the planning commission, uh, to talk to the parks and rec commission, get their input and so forth. I'm just, I'm just skittish uh, as commissioner Westberg was on the, uh, on setting up a formal appeal process right. without being sure what you're getting into. Excellent. All right, what is our next um, slide? Should gifts which aren't included in the city's budget or the gift needs inventory be reviewed at slash on established dates? So I'll, I'll preface this one a little bit. Some of those donations that just pop up uh, come to us with a sense of urgency on a uh, maybe a donor schedule more so. Um, that can be challenging. Uh, in the past, we address them almost as they came in immediately. Um, in this scenario, uh, we may be establishing certain, certain touch points throughout the year that we would look at them all in one, one swoop, I guess you could say. Commissioner Burstein. I can understand from a donor perspective, they may have different pressures of mm -hmm. using the money by a certain date um, for either their own um, financial structure or for tax reasons. So I wouldn't want to necessarily miss those opportunities at the same time. Um, and I can't imagine, it actually would be a great problem to get bogged down every month with donations, but we could specify the first month of every quarter to review any donations which have not been included in the budget or in the needs inventory. Usually the pressure is at the end of the quarter. So by front loading that um, with the donor, it might be useful in the discussion with the donor. I like the idea of having set times that can be published so that people can see that when they're um, reaching out uh, for, for their uh, donations. Um, Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Don Cohen, I think I'm opposed to this. Uh, if the if there may be things that come up, you know, somebody gets a certain honor, somebody passes away, somebody this and that, and, it, and sorry, we, we can't talk to you until January. I, I just, I, I just don't, I just, I think that staff ought to be able to deal with this procedurally in a way that makes sense without saying only during the first quarter of the year will we accept uh, uh, will we review uh, requests that aren't in the budget or the gift needs inventory? I, just, I guess I just, just a, I don't think I like that idea. Yeah, and just to clarify, first month of the quarter, not the first quarter. So you'd review it four times. Four a times a year. Got it. Okay, Commissioner Markson. Yeah, I I guess I would assume that if someone like something came up that they wanted to donate suddenly to the city in a short term, you know, with short turnaround time frame. that if it was, you know, that important either monetarily or because of something that happened that they could pick something from the gift needs inventory. Like, as opposed to, I mean, again, not knowing how big this or how likely it is that you would need to do short turnaround on gifts but um, you know, if it if it was happening so much, then it would like if it's only like one a year. Okay, then fine, let's do it uh, whenever they come in, or you know, something le less than ten, let's say. But if it's you know like twenty a year, 
-hmm. fifty a year, then it seems like you would just be, I don't know, it would just become unmanageable and not really setting the expectation. I don't think in an appropriate way for how we how we want to uh, organize and respond to gifts. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, and it, and a a good reason for us to have the gift inventory available. Uh, Vice Chair Struck. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter Struck. Yeah, I would just um, kind of echo what uh, Commissioner Markson just said. That I think that if you're going to kind of say we're we're going to be available, you know, 24/7 to review these, essentially. And again, I don't think the numbers going to be that great. But you're going to kind of default to that's going to be kind of the easiest thing. So I'm not opposed to doing this. I guess what I would suggest is that you know we within a year we would kind of review and say, hey, is is this working or not? Um, and, uh, and leave it at that because I, I I do see that it potentially could become a problem. Probably not, but that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Let sure. me ask a follow up to that. What if it wasn't a specific gift, but it was an idea? or a concept, which you're not immediately making a decision on. Um, so it's not quite fully baked. I'm just wondering if, to me, that starts to lay out more, more staff time that would be required for evaluation and uh, planning and scheduling time with, with the Parks Commission if, if needed. So I'm just wondering if we should differentiate in any way there or or not. Well, I do think there's a difference between a gift and an idea. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Burstein? I, I want to modify what I, I said earlier. Are we just anticipating a problem that doesn't exist and it's a problem we'd like to have? <laughs> And, 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 you know, if, if we say, hey, just bring it, bring ideas, bring money, um, and then we discover over a period of two months, we're just inundated and staff is completely underwater, doesn't have time to take care of other meaningful business, then we can revisit it. But let's, let's leave the door open to the problem and then solve the problem should it occur. I don't believe we currently have a problem, but I have seen um, sports organizations may be notorious for this, uh, who want facility upgrades or new facilities, and all of a sudden they they have money and, and they want to move forward with something that's not in the plan. Uh, that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, is it a challenge today? No. Thankfully, our, our facilities are getting updated and, and things are going really well. I think it could be in the next few years. Um, but to your point, uh, Commissioner Burstein, it's probably something that can wait. And through better developed processes, we're going to head those issues off much earlier than how they stacked up in the past. So that's that's just my feel there. Perfect. All right. Next slide. All right. Does the commission support standardized donor recognition objects for items on the gift needs inventory? So this is like a plaque of specific size. Um, here's some pictures of plaques that are currently on benches. Um, as you can see, there are a bunch of different designs. So uh, any commentary on this? Um, I think, yeah, perhaps we should look at having a look for the city of Mercer Island um, parks um, and make it consistent. Commissioner Cohen? Uh, Don Cohen. Well, since uh, one on a bench that my family and friends gave me for a, a big birthday a, a, a while ago is different from a lot of these. Mine's more like the one on the right here, although it's a rectangle, not a mm -hmm. inverted trapezoid. And, and the more typical ones like in Pioneer Park are like the one up on the left, the upper left. I kind of like Personally, I kind of like the uh, variety, but I don't feel really strongly about it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Markson. Um, <clears throat> I, I, they don't have a, well, in general, I would say that I support the idea of a specified size, but maybe they can have flexibility about what, of course, is inside that plaque. But I had a related question about this, if I could just ask really quick. Um, 
if people are donating things that don't have a place to put a plaque on them, what could they do for the donor recognition piece? Like, let's say they donate trees or, you know, well, anything that doesn't really have a, a logical place for a plaque. Or the fauna, if they're donating fauna. Yeah, but they're <laughs> donating frogs. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a specialized collar. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of different ways, uh, specifically on our website, recognizing if somebody was donating trees, that would be the, the most logical, um, would be to, to note that there. Uh, there could be, and, and I believe that the policy re revisions would support, um, you know, donated a grove of trees and the um, donor recognition object, which would be the plaque, um, fit the the character of the park, then that would be that would be permitted under this policy. Uh, but you would have to go through that's a little bit separate of a review because it's not on one of the you know it's not necessarily on the needs inventory um, trees maybe, but not that specific location. So it would be based on the on the initial request. We would have to review that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Don Cohen, I thought that Sarah's question was also about how would you uh, how would you plaque a tree, and oh. and, and for example, uh, I know at the Open Space Conservancy Trust over the years they talked about from staff's uh, idea of you get these fake rocks. Yeah, you know that you put plaques on. You know this. Uh, uh, this wonderful western red cedar tree made uh, possible through the generosity of the, uh, the da, 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 da. again, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad idea, but that could be done. Yeah, absolutely. We've done a uh, short little, little stubbed out plaques in some areas. Um, yeah, definitely not nailing it into that tree um, just to be safe, but yeah. Uh, just some examples that I've seen also um, an online mapping system that um, recognizes the location of the tree and you can have kind of a digital plaque kind of option. Um, also having a single kind of recognition area, like a large sign that has different, you know, kind of listings there um, of different recognitions. Cool. Similar to what we've done at Island Crest Park, if you saw the turf project out there, there's a few plaques that are up against the uh, concession stand uh, that, that recognize all of the donors for that project. I like the idea of Mercer Island having an app that shows people, maybe have, we have a parks app that shows our trails and then also highlights different things that people have donated. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, when establishing the cost of a piece of equipment for donation, should the fee include just the initial investment, or should it include just the equipment price, or should it include equipment install maintenance for established useful life? I think this was touched on briefly earlier. Commissioner Hay. I think that depends on the gift and the item, right? Are, are we, when you say equipment, are you, you're only talking about equipment, you're not talking about benches or art or anything like that? Uh, I would consider benches part of this. Um, so I would say anything that would be like an, an inventory type item would probably fall under this. Things like batting cages may also need upkeep, um, but that's kind of dependent. I think, I'm not sure. I think Ryan might know more. Yeah, I when when we were drafting this question, we were really focused on you know probably the benches being our most prominent, maybe picnic tables, those kinds of things. Um, art is a little bit different because uh, that's part of our public art inventory, and that's um, taken care of through the one percent fund. Uh, so this would be you know for this conversation, I'd be thinking about a specific bench, um, and and what costs. Uh, to be able to make that donation, should we be capturing? Yeah, I think that's where it's, it, yeah, I mean, it depends on what the item is, right? Because some of this can be covered by other funds. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is where determining the cost 
of the maintenance of the gift is really important as part of that acceptance um, criteria to um, decide if if we sh if we need to include funds for maintaining it. Um, so something large like the batting cages, maybe that's something we are you know that is something we would need to consider, right? But if it's a small statue or a bench would be completely different. So, I mean, I guess this is a, um, you know, it would be a, you can't really have a blanket policy for this, right? It's kind of hard. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, Don Cohen. Uh, Ryan, what uh, the price for a bench now, I think uh, at a meeting last time or the time before you said was like $3,500 or something like that. Does, uh, I always figured that included the equipment and installation, but I never could figure out how you would figure out maintenance for the established useful life, which might be, you know, 30, uh, mm -hmm. 30 years or something. And, but, yeah. but I don't know, what do you, how did, how did you, do you take into account uh, the useful life maintenance now in uh, pricing benches? We don't no. Uh, the the price is really the cost of the bench uh, plus installation yeah. uh, is is how we're factoring that. I would if I was going to kind of make my personal recommendation, um, and and I was going to look at this and and price things out, and I would need to work with Sam Harb, our our parks maintenance manager. I would kind of look at it like. If, if the city was going to buy a bench anyways, we were going to buy a bench and we were going to maintain it in that location and it wasn't a donation. That's what I would probably set the price at and not include the ongoing maintenance of that, that bench uh, because the donor is already taking that capital expense on. Uh, in a different scenario where uh, I think we use the, the batting cage as an example, that wasn't an identified city expense. Um, so, so you have that capital, uh, that initial capital investment, and then you really have to weigh what, um, you know, what those ongoing expenses are going to be. I think it is a bit impractical or, or difficult uh, to ask a donor to pay for the operation of a facility that's open to the entire public. Now, it's, it's definitely worth asking and figuring out you know what the benefits are uh, for the donor as well as the as the park system. But if it was an identified object that we were already planning to purchase, I would probably lean toward uh, having that one-time cost of of bench plus installation. Commissioner Markson. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> what Ryan just said, you know, is similar to what I was thinking that. It doesn't make sense to me. I just, from a, a theoretical perspective, that we would ask for a donation, and then ask, like, with the, and then ask the donor to pay for its ongoing maintenance, because that kind of implies that we, as a city, didn't really want that donation to begin with. Like, it, it has doesn't have some sort of an intrinsic value to the parks and rec department and like it's uh, it's almost like giving away property or having private property on your parks and recreation land so i don't know just from a theory perspective it doesn't make sense plus it does sound really complicated and i assume we wouldn't put something in that we aren't able to maintain willing and able to maintain because it's a benefit right that's the point here we have this gift registry because it's something that's going to benefit fit within the about the characteristics of the city parks. So anyway, that's I would I would vote for not including maintenance. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Struck. Yes, thank you, Peter Struck. Um, I take a little bit different approach, um, although I think it's been alluded to. But I would I would go back to the kind of the cost recovery levels that we talked about with the uh, so many of our programs. And so, for example, you know if you look at a, at a park bench. Well, that's pretty much 100% community. I mean, you're not going to, there's not going to be, the donor is going to be sitting at that bench 90% of the time or something like that. Right. So I would say the for that, the maintenance probably should be not included. But then if you take the batting cage, well, that's a combination because there is a very small group, the base, call it the baseball club, um, that's going to get the most benefit from that, use it the most. 
um, the community benefit is some, but it's not 100%. And so there, I think you could have a, a, a rationale for saying that, that there should be some kind of maintenance uh, charge built in um, for, for if that facility was to be gifted type of thing. So um, that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide. How many slides do we have left, just out of curiosity? Ta-da! <laughs> oh, those are all really good questions. Hey, hey, Jody. Yes. Oh, this is Don Cohen. Uh, by the way, the bench thing, it just doesn't really work very easily to price that maintenance out beforehand. So this bench that my family and friends donated, the problems with it are dogs digging away the uh, under support area, somebody or somebody removed one of the screws from the plaque or it fell out and and uh, Paul and Elaine, you know, have taken care of those things over the course of the time that I've had it. And so how would you price that stuff out beforehand? It just doesn't work. And that may be very different from some other uh, gifts. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think, I feel like the maintenance thing would be an exceptional thing on certain, um, but not all gifts. Yeah. And quite honestly, that that does fall in probably with some of our specialized artwork. You know, where where maybe we need to, if a if an artist wanted to donate a piece of work, um, we may require them to provide maintenance services for that because maybe our park maintenance guys aren't artistic enough to to provide that level of maintenance because it's so specialized. Um, so just something, everything's a little bit different. This was a super helpful conversation to um, wrap our heads around. And I, I, I think I took away reducing barriers, um, recognizing community benefit from donations that we receive and ensuring that it's, it's benefiting the community and not maybe just the individual donor is, as Commissioner Strzok was speaking about a little bit with, with, the batting cages, which we also rent out and collect bees on, and those pay for the maintenance. So we do have a, we at least have a, a operational plan for for those kinds of things as well. Excellent. Um, okay, let's go to the fourth item of business, uh, which is the 2022 planning and meeting schedule update. Planning schedule. Um, we got one meeting left in the year. It's right around the corner here in December, and we have the um, bike skills area conversation, as well as an update on 2020 or a review of 2022 services and uh, the planning schedule uh, and work plan for staff on uh, 2023. Three additional items that are coming will be the Aubrey Davis uh, Park Trail Improvement update, hopefully. Uh, that'll be coming forward at that December meeting, as well as uh, the gift policy coming back also. And then um, we'll be discussing the 2023, as I said, uh, planning schedule at that meeting also. Okay, was that it? Yes. No more curveballs? Okay. Um, okay, the fifth item of business is commissioner's reports and work plan updates. Um, I see Commissioner Cohen has his hand up. Oh, I, I had a comment on what Ryan said the, about the December 1st meeting. Aubrey Davis Park, uh, bike skills area, donor policy. Um, uh, leave it to Ryan, but that seems like that is going to be a lot to do. I think you're going to have uh, probably as much public comment uh, as you, you know, probably more than you usually have because of the Aubrey Davis and bike skills stuff. So, that seems like a very ambitious uh, agenda. It is. <laughs> I, I think we're going to find out a little bit more here in the next couple of weeks on ensuring that whether or not the Aubrey Davis Trail uh, is going to come forward or not. The uh, services review and the planning schedule, I do anticipate those being quick conversations because it's it's recap of this year and where we're going next year. So not a lot of it's more informational. Um, and then the um, gift policy, we thought tonight was going to be really quick, but <laughs> not quite, but we got good stuff out of it. So um, 
I think I think we'll see where we end up at that meeting. Vice Chair Strzok. Yes, um, just uh, I wanted to report that uh, last week I happened to listen to the KCLS Library Board uh, of Trustees meeting, and they are presenting their KCLS staff was presenting the 23 uh, budget and outlook and so forth. And the one key takeaway that I took was that KCLS is hoping to, or is planning, I shouldn't say hoping, planning to increase library hours by 26% next year. So hopefully that means that uh, for the Mercer Island Library, we'll get our Saturday hours back. Um, we'll wait and see, but I was I was encouraged by that. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to watch that meeting and bring that back to us. Um, yeah, I went to the pumpkin walk on Sunday and really had a great time there. Um, the city did a great job with that. And uh, really, it was nice to see that. And hopefully we can have uh, more events like that. Commissioner Markson. Uh, I was just going to report out that I participated in the Ellis Pond restoration event. It was a couple of weekends ago. It was a really uh, nice event. There was a nice group of people there, lots of kids. So anyway, it was well run. I appreciated it. Awesome. Thank you for highlighting that. Anybody else? All right. With that, um, I'm going to say that as a reminder, the next regular Parks and Recreation Commission meeting is December 1st, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. The time is now 7.46 and the meeting is adjourned. However, as a reminder to commissioners, please stay seated. And the city staff has terminated the Zoom broadcast and good evening and stay safe and healthy, everyone. <laughs>